The Jerry Pal Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, preparing society and meeting the needs of an aging population. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast. This is Eric Rodera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have on Skype today? And on Skype today, we have Dr. Benzie Kluger, who is director of the Palliative Care Research Center and the Neuropalliative Care Division at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Benzie. Thanks for having me. So we're going to be talking about a JAMA neurology paper that you were lead author on, on comparison comparison of integrated outpatient palliative care with standard care in patients with Parkinson's disease and related disorders. Just came out. Um and maybe get some tips on uh, how best to care for Parkinson's patients, both in palliative care and in geriatrics. But before we do, we always start off with a song request. You got a song request for Alex. I do. How about uh, Cat Stevens' Father and Son? Great. And why this song? Uh, it's always, uh, uh, I don't know, it's had a special place in my heart. I always get a little bit teary when I, when I hear it. It reminds me of my dad who passed away. Yeah. It's not time to make a change, just relax, take it easy, you're still young, that's your fault, there's so much you have to know, find a girl, settle down, if you want, you can marry, look at me, I am old, but I'm happy, I was once like you are. It's not easy. How did you get interested in the, this intersection between palliative care and movement disorders, Parkinson's disease? Yeah, well, it wasn't uh, through a well-developed career plan, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, it really started, I uh, did uh, movement disorders and behavioral neurology as a fellow. And, and after a fellowship, uh, you know, began seeing patients where our current model of care really doesn't have very much to offer. I could give people Aricept, I could take away their driver's license, I could watch their cognitive scores go downhill, and at, and at some point they would just stop coming to see me because, uh, you know, I really had nothing to offer them. And so I had a both a spiritual and a personal crisis around that. Um, on the spiritual side, I got more into Zen, um, worked on my relationship with suffering, dying, and on the professional side, I had the fortune of uh, meeting Gene Kuttner. Uh, learning more about palliative care, uh, Janice Miyasaki, who's one of the co-authors, had been doing palliative care for Parkinson's since 2008. And, and it was just this, you know, kind of this is what I was meant to do kind of moment once I started to get into it. And, uh, you know, without having planned to do so, I mean, that's really become, you know, become my career. And can you t tell us a little bit more about um what it's like clinically from what what were the gaps that you saw specifically in palliative care for people with Parkinson's disease that really triggered your interest in this area? Yeah, uh, you know, one was uh, you know one working with difficult emotions. Uh, so as you know, as a medical doctor, we're we're trained. Uh, you know, I could diagnose somebody with depression or anxiety. I could prescribe them Prozac. Uh, but I was seeing somebody who I didn't have the language for it, but at the, you know, but they were having anticipatory grief. They were, they were frustrated. Uh, they were, you know, experiencing a fear of dementia. Uh, and, and, you know, and I felt, you know, really kind of helpless and powerless in front of these uh, very strong emotions. Um, and I wanted to do something about it, but I, I didn't have any tools to do anything about it. Mm hmm. I would say, you know, another singular event that I that I talk about a lot was I was in uh, in clinic with a young young girl, woman, 20 years old with Huntington's disease. Uh, she had had it for 10 years, um, and I asked her, you know, if she was having problems sleeping, and she said she was because she was afraid of dying in her sleep. Mm. And that was just this uh, real. Uh, kind of elucidating moment. It was, uh, you know, did something that uh, four years of 
you know, communication training and spiritual training and stuff that was supposed to be part of my medical curriculum couldn't do, which was really hitting home for me that, you know, why spirituality was important in taking care of people with serious illness. And, you know, and I actually, I remember talking to Jean afterwards. I'm like, you know, what do you do when this comes up? And she t told me about chaplains and what chaplains did, because I, I, I really didn't know what chaplains did at that point. And, you know, and, and actually a month later, we had a team, we had a chaplain volunteer, we had a social worker, we had this clinic that we started a half day a month, um, you know, really on a volunteer basis. I did it. I think I got it done because I didn't tell anyone about it. Um, I, you know, we didn't get approval for it. And, you know, and then that clinic and what we learned in that clinic over the course of the next year uh, really became this PCORI grant, which then became this JAMA Neurology paper. How long mm -hmm. ago was that clinic? Uh, I think it was 2013. Yeah, I think it was February 2013. We had our our first clinic, and uh, and actually most of the people on that team are were are also on the paper. And when you think about uh, palliative care and Parkinson's disease and movement disorders, is it like a is that a hot topic in the movement disorders field, or is are you like a little? niche of the field who's thinking about this? Yeah, I, I, I would say, and this is probably true in a lot of areas, I, I think it's growing. It's it's not as hot as I think it should be. Um, you know, maybe this paper will help, help to change that. Uh, you know, I think there's been some lip service given to it. I would say, you know, over the last three to five years that this, you know, the field of neuropalliative care has really taken off. Um, you know, there, in 1996, uh, the American Academy of Neurology had a position piece on palliative care and felt that it was the job of every neurologist to learn the principles of palliative care. And between 1996, I would say in 2016, absolutely nothing happened. You know, it wasn't part mm. of recipes. I knew nothing about it. Uh, but it, but it's fine. I think it's finally gaining some traction. Um, you know, I, I think part of that, you know, be interested in your um, experiences with this. But, you know, I think younger doctors, people coming out of medical school and residency now have a broader awareness uh, of palliative care or are saying things differently. When I talk to people who are interviewing for residency now and I tell them what I do that, that, that they really, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people really light up about it, you know? So, so I feel it's a way that the field is, is moving and, 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 um, and growing, um, you know, but it hasn't really become a, you know, certainly not to the degree that it hasn't cancer, you know, something that's, you know, mainstream and accepted. For our listeners, as we're starting to think about focusing on par Parkinson's disease, you know, our listeners are, you know, doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, a few researchers, and a few other uh, folks. But they are fairly wide audience, and they may have more or less familiarity with Parkinson's disease. I wonder yeah. if you could give sort of a like, just a lay explanation of what Parkinson's is and what you know typical courses and symptoms. Sure. So, so Parkinson's disease is the uh, second most common neurodegenerative illness. So it's second only to Alzheimer's disease. It's about one to 2% of people over age 60 will develop Parkinson. Um, but the other thing that I'll mention up front is it's also in the United States, the 14th leading cause of death. Um, and a lot of times I think neurologists may be even more guilty of this than others, you know, that we don't think about Parkinson's disease as a terminal illness. You know, mm. I think pictures of Parkinson's disease is Tremor, it's Michael J. Fox. Um, you know, Savis Finney, who's a famous cycler, we talk about living well with Parkinson's, but, but Parkinson's disease is, is a terminal illness, you know, that people's life expectancy is shortened, people die of complications of this disorder. And, and I think one of the challenges with Parkinson's, you know, in terms of trying to describe it succinctly is that there's a lot of variability, that we have people who've had Parkinson's for 30 years and they look pretty good as long as they're on their medicines. And we have other people who within five or 10 years are wheelchair bound, they're demented, and they die of aspiration pneumonia or a fall or something like that. So, so I think it's, you know, in part this variability and heterogeneity that makes it uh, challenging, you know, to, to tackle you know, with a, a succinct, you know, palliative care model. Um, you know, the traditional motor symptoms, tremor, slowness, problems with walking are there. Um, you know, other things people don't think about as much is that 80% of people with Parkinson's will develop dementia if they live 15 to 20 years with the disorder. Um, about two thirds to three fourths will have significant pain related to their Parkinson's. There's a myth out there that Parkinson's is not painful. That's not true. Mm -hmm. um, anxiety and depression are about twice as common as say rheumatoid arthritis at a similar level of disability. So it affects people's mood. Um, uh, demoralization is more common with Parkinson's and other neurologic disorders. Caregiver burden is high, you know, and so as I, I think as I 
talk about it. I, I mean, hopefully people listening in are like, well, you know, why haven't people been doing palliative care for Parkinson's all along? Because it's, <laughs> yeah. I think when you really get beneath the surface of it, it's, it's a, a perfect disorder for a, a palliative model of care. When do you think that palliative model of care for Parkinson's, when do you think it should, should happen? Uh, well, I, I think it should happen. And, and we, you know, we can talk about uh, what we mean by palliative care, but I think yeah. the palliative approach needs to happen at the time of diagnosis. Um, and, we, and we have a, actually a qualitative article. There was an article actually done 10 years before we did uh, called Dropping the Bomb, uh, the experience of getting the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, and, and this also, I think, you know, goes into a blind spot that a lot of neurologists have is that uh, most neurologists, and I would say myself included for, for quite a while, felt that giving someone a diagnosis of Parkinson's was good news because it's better than Alzheimer's, it's better than ALS, it's better than a brain tumor. We have treatments for it. We have carbidopa and levodopa and deep, deep brain stimulation. Um, but, you know, for the person getting that news, of, of course, it's not good news. And when we did these qualitative interviews, I would hear this story again and again that, you know, people saw a neurologist uh, based on the way they walked or their tremor. They were diagnosed within five minutes. They were given Cinemet. They were told to come back in six months. And they were, you know, in tears by the time they got to their car. And it took them several years for them to catch up emotionally um, to that diagnosis. So, so I think, you know, that there's a, a big need, um, and this is something I'm working on, uh, training neurologists in primary palliative care and, and developing these skills because, the, you know, there are aspects of uh, palliative care for, for Parkinson's that um, really are not, never going to be solved with the consultative model. Yeah. So there, there's, a, there's this need for primary palliative care. So making sure that all movement disorders, they're delivering really high quality primary palliative care. And there's this thing that you write about in this JAMA Neuro paper, which is more of a specialty care model. I'm going to ask, actually, I'm going to hold off on asking when does the specialty care model fit in until we actually talk about does the specialty care model work? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so we can you know jump into the paper. I, I think the paper shows, uh, you know, from my perspective, fairly convincingly uh, that that it does work. That we uh, improved patients' quality of life, um, caregiver burden was was improved, particularly at 12 months in, which is I think uh, telling. And and we see this clinically actually is that I think as Parkinson's, as Alzheimer's, as these other diseases progress, that there's almost these uh, intersecting trajectories where our care you know, is more about helping the care partner at some point than about the patient. Yeah. At least the benefit becomes greater for the patient and family. So the really interesting thing is this is not just at one site. You you did this study at three different sites between 2015 and 2017. Um, who were the actual Parkinson's patients that you enrolled? Kind of getting into both uh, when should it happen and the specialty, like who were included. So let's start off with who are the patients? So the, the patients, and, and this, you know, I think was a departure from the typical palliative care study. You know, a, a lot of palliative care studies, you know, are defined based on your diagnosis. You have stage four lung cancer or a certain stage of illness or, you know, prognosis. Uh, but we purposefully designed the study around needs. Uh, we used something called the needs assessment tool, uh, Parkinson's disease, which was based on the NAT PC, which had been out there for a while. And so people in our study um, could have advanced disease, and some of them did, but some of them uh, were enrolled because of high uh, caregiver distress, uh, high moral and existential distress, uh, difficulties coping with symptoms such as pain or fatigue, um, complex psychosocial situations. So we, we really, uh, I don't know, for better or for worse, and we did talk about it quite a bit, you know, decided that we were going to give a fairly broad uh, intervention to, for, with fairly broad inclusion criteria, in part because that, that was really a reflection of what we were doing in our practice. And what we wanted people to do was, was we wanted people to refer on the basis of need rather on the basis of, you know, prognosis or something else that's a little bit more difficult to define with Parkinson's. What did you do as far as the intervention? So the, the, the intervention, and the, the, this was, uh, you know, again, a learning experience for us. So as, as you mentioned, we had three different sites and uh, we were all doing things differently. Um, and, and even at the end of the study, we were doing things differently, but we wanted to figure out some way to make, make it that it was standardized enough that we could write a paper and, and standardized enough that other people in other places, uh, you know, would be able to replicate it. Um, so, so I think the, the real heart of this intervention 
uh, was tr trying to figure out, uh, you know, what are the issues that we need to address? And so we developed a checklist for the physician that would include things like, you know, talking about prognosis, uh, talking about pain, swallowing, uh, weight loss. We had a checklist for our chaplain, um, you know, going over things like guilt and grief and loneliness and our social worker for care, care partner support. Um, our nurse was looking at things like home health care and nutrition. And, and so I, I, don't, I can't speak for anyone else, but I, I think when we first started the study, I, I thought everyone else needed the checklist, but I didn't. Um, and I, I soon really appreciated the checklist. I mean, I, I think I think the checklist was might, maybe the, the single most important thing of why we had a benefit. You know, we had a huge benefit in the ESAS, uh, seven points at six months. And I think that was just because we had a checklist and people in usual care did not have a checklist. And, and so we always asked about things like depression and pain and constipation that tended to fall between the cracks. Mm -hmm. And just uh, to interrupt for one second, yeah. ESAS, just to remind our listeners, sure. is the Edmonton Symptom Assessment yeah. Scale. It's a, a sort of broad measure of a variety of symptoms uh, scored, I think, 0 to 10 or, or, yep. or 1 to 10, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep, 0 to 10. So, yeah, so it, it was, uh, you know, in, 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 our, in our group, so they included a, a nurse, there was a chaplain, there was a social worker, there was a neurologist with an interest but no board certification in palliative care. And each clinic worked a little bit differently. I, I would say that our clinic in Colorado, you know, was maybe the most, uh, maybe this, you know, what I would call a more pure hybrid model of, of neuropalliative care, uh, where we very rarely involved Jean Kuttner. She she was important for the study, absolutely, and she helped provide us guidance and coaching and looked over charts, mm -hmm. uh, but really saw patients. Um, at uh, Alberta, almost everyone saw a uh, the palliative medicine specialist, and everyone was in the room at the same time. Ours was a serial model where people were seen in serial. And at San Francisco was kind of uh, in between that that the palliative medicine provider was much more involved than in Colorado, less than at Alberta. Uh, people were generally seen sequentially, but sometimes done in pairs. Um, and at the end of the day, it, it didn't matter which of those specific models you used, as long as you were using the checklist, as long as you were addressing these issues systematically, uh, that there wasn't any uh, a significant difference in terms of uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. And when you say sequentially versus it together, do you mean neurologist and palliative care team together, or do you mean like palliative care uh, component, different components of the yeah. palliative care team? Well, so, yeah, no. So uh, different people. So, and, and this kind of gets into you know, which you know, we we had to invent as do other people of how to do outpatient palliative care because it's very different than inpatient palliative care. So at Colorado, um, and now at, you know we're getting this off the ground in Rochester, but at Colorado we had a very busy neuropalliative care clinic that we, we would see, you know, 25 to 30 people in a day. Wow. Uh, and, and the only way we could do that was that every, you know, we had a bunch of rooms. It was a Friday, so, and people don't want to be in clinic on Friday in Colorado. They want to be up in the mountains. So we, we had clinic to ourselves. Uh, you know, we had six rooms running, and, uh, you know, we would rotate, you know, the neurologists and the chaplains that were in order to provide this sequential team-based care. And then at lunch and at the end of the day, we would kind of have an interdisciplinary powwow to make sure that things didn't fall between the cracks. But it, it was a you know really busy clinic. Um, at Alberta, you know, they would see, you know, maybe four, three or four patients in an afternoon and everybody on the team goes in at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, and there's advantages and disadvantages of each model. I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we often struggled with is, you know, having patients, they don't want to tell the same story again and again. We don't want things to fall between the cracks. Um, we, we always learn from each other when, when we do talk about cases. So there's, you know, advantages in, you know, doing things as, as a whole team. Um, and at the same time, you know, there's, you know, there's advantages, you know, certainly in terms of efficiency, uh, but I think there's other advantages in terms of doing things sequentially that, that people actually got to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with the chaplain. I think they may have gotten, you know, more with, you know, spiritual being, but, um, and, and certain other aspects of it. So, you know, so, I, you know, I guess at the end of the day, you know, it, it comes down to, uh, you know, what you do is more important than how you do it. And if I want to replicate some of what you were doing, are the, the checklists, are they on the supplements for the JAMA uh, paper? They are. And if you're interested, uh, there's actually a, a paper that I've probably referred more people to than anything else I've written, which is a it's, it's in Annals of Palliative Medicine, and it's called Implementation of Outpatient Neuropalliative Care or something along those lines. 
but it has all of our checklists. It talks about how we use our whiteboard. It talks about how we schedule. Great. If you can send that to me, I'll, I'll have a link of that on our show notes on our Jerry Pal website. Can we talk about the results? Like, what did you actually find? Um, yeah, so the, the results... Uh, our primary outcome was, or two primary outcomes. So one was quality of life, and we used something called the quality of life AD for Alzheimer's disease. And we chose that measure because it uh, measures general quality of life as opposed to health related. Because um, we didn't believe we were going to change, you know, whether or not people would be able to go to the grocery store or walk five blocks. Uh, we thought we would have more of an impact on how they, on their primary relationships and how they thought about themselves. Um, and, and we found that uh, at th- as actually as early as three months, but but also at six months, um, which was our primary outcome, that people had in the primary care arm had improved quality of life versus in the control arm. And I think looking at it in a different way, when we segmented it by a clinically significant change of at least three points on this, that uh, almost double the n- number of people um, in the primary in the palliative care arm had an improvement versus in usual care. Mm. And, you know, similarly, in, in kind of a, in contrast, is that uh, half as many people had a clinically significant worsening in the palliative care group versus in the um, uh, usual care. And, and I think both are significant, you know, because this is a progressive neurodegenerative illness. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, the improvements might be masked by other things worsening at the same time. So, so that, that you know, I, I'm proud of. Uh, for caregiver burden, there was a significant improvement at 12 months. And depending on how you looked at the data, um, in our primary intent to treat analysis, there was a trend, but there wasn't a significant benefit to caregiver burden. But if you looked at what treatment people actually got, because we had 12 people who crossed over to actually get palliative care because they weren't doing well, when we looked at treatment as received, uh, caregiver burden was better at, at six months. And no matter how you looked at it, it was better at 12 months. And I think that's because, again, the disease is more progressed and, and those patients you know, are going to get more benefit. Um, the other thing I actually to jump back that I would say about it is that we purposefully excluded people who had urgent palliative care needs. Um, uh, because we felt it would be unethical. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people in palliative care are pretty soft-hearted, and so we didn't feel like it would be, you know, we all believe that palliative care helped, and so if people had urgent needs, if their caregiver was about to burn out, whatever, we just got them right into clinic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that makes our results that much more significant because in secondary analyses, the people with the highest needs, not surprisingly, got the most benefit. Um, some secondary outcomes that we looked at was symptom burden, which was probably our single biggest effect, uh, was that people had much better symptom burden in palliative care, um, spiritual well-being uh, for both patients, uh, actually even more notable for caregivers, caregiver anxiety, um, advanced care planning, both in terms of quantity and quality was better in palliative care. So not only did we do it more, but the, the forms were, were the state-specific form. We used the most in the post form. Uh, people's doctors had it. It was on the chart um, as opposed to, you know, just checking off the box that, that, it, that it was done. So, so I think across the board, you know, I, I think we showed that this model of care uh, works. Mm-hmm. And for people, you know, we always ask this question when we're um, uh, uh, learning about multi-component interventions. Now, this is the Diane Meyer question. What's in the palliative care syringe? And you alluded to this a little bit before with the checklist and uh, you know attention to symptoms specifically. If you know, if do you have a sense of what specific components of the intervention were really key yeah. in making these differences? Uh, yeah, I've, I've given it a lot of thought, uh, you know, and, and maybe you'll invite me back in three years when this next study is done. Uh, but we, we just got another PCORI grant. And, and the goal of this PCORI grant is to take this outpatient model of care and to make this uh, the standard for all of the Parkinson's Foundation centers of excellence across the country. Um, and, and so in those centers of excellence, they don't all have chaplains. They don't all have social workers. And so we really had to take a step back and, and ask, that, ask ourselves that question. Um, and, and I think, you know, the things that we came up with, you know, is, is one is making things systematic, using checklists, using templated notes. Um, I think advanced care planning and goals of care discussions was really key. And this also came out of some of our qualitative interviews that we're going to be publishing later. Mm-hmm. Um, that People felt like they had a roadmap for this illness as opposed to feeling their way forward in, in the dark. Um, you know, I, I think a second thing 
uh, you know, was systematically addressing non-motor symptoms. And we know from a lot of studies that over half the time they're uh, not successfully treated because they're not recognized. That's true for depression. That's true for pain. Uh, that's true for constipation. They just tend to fall between the cracks. Um, I think providing caregiver support systematically, which is really not part of Parkinson's care, is important. So whether that's done by a social worker or a counselor um, or a support group or group visit, uh, I think is less important than the fact that they're acknowledged and, and that we have support for them. Um, and then recognizing, you know, these other psychosocial aspects of, of the illness and addressing them in some way. So things like grief, guilt, loneliness um, that, again, you know, are not typically addressed in our current models of care. And again, whether those, you know, so we kind of came up with these four pillars of what we felt were the key aspects of this intervention. And, and that's going to be the, I think, the fun and the challenge of this next grant is, uh, you know, for different sites to figure out their own means of, of, uh, of meeting these pillars. So I'm going to go back to my question I asked earlier was, where does this model of care fit into the Parkinson's disease spectrum? Let's say I have this clinic that I can do. do. Do I give it to every Parkinson's patient? Do I give it to those with just high palliative care needs? Do I just give it to end stage Parkinson's? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so to, to answer that, uh, I mean, so so I've, I've moved uh, to Rochester. I was in Colorado for the last ten years. I just moved to Rochester, and you know, kind of using this as an opportunity of doing some things that I wanted to do before of kind of creating our neuro palliative care model 2.0. Um, and, and so in neuro palliative care 2.0, I, I think we're focusing a lot more across the department on primary palliative care. Um, I think we're, you know, going to be doing a better job with uh, needs assessment. And I, and I don't think everybody needs to come. And actually, it's not even going to be possible that every Parkinson's patient or every neurology patient goes to a interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary clinic. Um, and so I think one of our challenges as a department is figuring out, you know, can we uh, develop palliative care champions within each division. Uh, can we do things? Actually, at Colorado, one of the things that we did was we had an annual Parkinson's clinic where people saw physical and speech and other therapists and had their walking and voice measured and stuff like that. But part of that clinic was doing advanced care planning, screening for depression, and looking at quality of life. Uh, so, so I think part of the trick is going to be making some of these things r routine and proactive. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then, uh, then it is going to be based on need. But I, again, I don't know that the that the need for everybody is going to be being seen at this clinic. You know, for some people, uh, the need may be you know getting a social worker uh, for them. Uh, you know, uh, seeing a counselor. You know, so so I think I, I guess I would say that you know that systematic screening, you know, may be more valuable than the interdisciplinary clinic themselves and catching these things earlier. Mm. Uh, yeah. As our as our clinic evolved at, at Colorado, you know, when we first started, you know, it was all train wrecks. It was all people who probably should have gone to hospice three months earlier, you know, as people on the verge of suicide and and caregivers who were burnt out and things like that. And and I think you know we we discovered over time is that if we could see those same people one or two years earlier, um, and, and have a much more proactive model patient palliative care that that. You know, not only was our work more satisfying, but I think we, we did a better job uh, for that patient. Although we certainly ha helped them when they came in in crisis. So, so I, I think you know it's kind of th rethinking our model again about uh, you know not just primary palliative care, but but I think going beyond primary palliative care and kind of reaching this middle ground, this hybrid ground, which I think is good, important yeah. for cardiology and nephrology and all kinds of areas where you have to really integrate in a meaningful way. Um, you know, a deep knowledge of, of these illnesses with uh, palliative care principles. I, I got a question. My, my last question for you is um, you worked with palliative care providers um, and a lot of our listeners, both geriatricians and palliative care uh, providers from a lot of different disciplines, were there things that they were surprised of when caring for Parkinson's disease? Like, oh, I wish I knew that before. Yeah, there, there absolutely were. I mean, the most obvious one that, that comes up uh, is, I mean, role of medications in hospice is, is a huge one. Um, it j just actually over the last month um, in, in another study I'm doing, uh, you know, Haldol is still part of the hospice kit that's given out routinely to people with Parkinson's. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it is, it, you know, for people who don't know that Haldol blocks dopamine, uh, all of our medications for Parkinson's are trying to promote dopamine. So, so that can be, you know, disastrous actually for, for, for someone with Parkinson's disease. 
similarly, uh, some of the medications we use, like Cinemad, Amantadine, Dopamine Agonist, if they're abruptly stopped or tapered, uh, people can actually have something like neuromale- neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, you know, what to do with deep brain stimulation. So, so those are, you know, some very obvious practical challenges. But, but I think the uh, providers that we worked with, I don't think, you know, like, like neurologists, I don't think they were thinking about Parkinson's necessarily as a, as a terminal illness. Um, I don't think they were thinking, nor, nor were we. And I think this is kind of where this crosstalk of dialogue comes in, of, of really trying to recognize, you know, when people with Parkinson's are entering a terminal phase and should start hospice. And, and there are some clues, you know, weight loss being one of them, loss of appetite. Um, you know, I think we're used to thinking about decline in disorders as a straight line, but in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, it's never a straight line. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's marked by dwindling and plateaus, but when it accelerates, you know, when that threshold is reached, like that, that's always a time where, where I will think about, about hospice. Um, you know, I think they didn't recognize as a lot of people don't, of, of, you know, in general, how bad neurologists are when it comes to things like pain and advanced care planning and, and goals of care. You know, they, I think they were surprised that, that these things are just not on our radar. Mm-hmm. So uh, so it, 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 it was, uh, you know, and, and I think for both us, you know, both us as neurologists, both us as palliative medicine providers, you know, I think we learned so much by the end of the study that we you know probably would have designed it differently you know had we started the study at the end of the study when we right. really knew what we were doing but you know that's that's research for you yeah, that's research for you this is terrific work my last question uh just running with the same theme is are there specific um medications that you would either favor using or avoiding for common conditions in parkinson's such as pain and mm-hmm. depression sure so for for pain you know, I, I guess a, a few things to to say about that. I mean, one is you know to you know start with things like physical therapy. Uh, that some pain in Parkinson's is related to muscular rigidity. So so sometimes manipulation of the dopamine medications can work. Um, Botox is something that we sometimes do. Um, you know, opiates can be used, and I have some patients on opiates. There was actually a, a study of opiates for for Parkinson's that was positive. So, so you don't have to completely shy away from them, but you would want to, you know, really try to address the specific causes of pain before, you know, going going to opiates. And oftentimes, uh, you know, manipulating other medications can help with that. Uh, with depression, I don't think I have any specific tricks out out of what you know most of you would probably do. Um, you know, I look to see what other side effects. You know, we might take advantage of if people are having problems sleeping, we'll, you know, use Remeron. If people are having problems with apathy or motivation, we might use Wellbutrin. Um, you know, certainly if people are having hallucinations, uh, quetiapine or Seroquel um, is the go-to for neurologists. Um, that even other atypicals like uh, olanzapine and Zyprexin, things like that, uh, block dopamine to a very significant level compared to quetiapine. So so that, that, would, that one I would say is... Uh, you know, definitely a kind of a pearl or something that we would, uh, you know, favor above above all else. Can I ask you, so if I'm caring for somebody in a hospice and they're starting to have swallowing problems and difficulty taking their cinnamon, um, what the heck do I do? Yeah. Uh, it, so there's uh, a few options now. I mean, the, the oldest and cheapest one is so cinnamon, you know, can be crushed. Uh, so you can mix it in applesauce. Uh, we actually use it um, in you know, orange juice as a booster dose, and people can kind of take it as needed that way. Uh, there have been a, a few papers. I haven't really done this very often, but you you know, in theory, you can give it per rectum. Uh, there is work being done right now uh, to develop a sub Q delivery, which I think will be great for for a lot of people. There, there's a nasal spray that's out now that's uh, pretty expensive. And I think this is also another example where, where being proactive is helpful. So if you wean back cinema gradually, you know, oftentimes people don't need or, or actually even do better off of medications towards the end of life. And, and that's actually one of a there's a paper showing that that is uh, one of the most important prognostic predictors of uh, in Parkinson's disease is this loss of benefit. Um, so so it is something that you can do. And, and I would say practically what, what we often see is that when people reach a point where they can no longer swallow, they can no longer get food, uh, you know, that they are kind of in the days to hours range, you know, and as long as you support them, you could also use benzodiazepines and things like that to help with muscle spasms and to help with pain. Um, and, and generally, we're able to, you know, help people through it. But, but you know, we, we can wean people off safely even in advance of that point because more often than not, it's, it's not doing too much for them, you know, in the weeks prior to that. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. 
We'll also have a link on our Jerry Pal website. There's a, I, I like a paper that it was uh, from JPSM on the 10 tips for palliative care providers in caring for individuals with Parkinson's disease. We'll have a link to that. Um, and Benzie, if you have any other great resources for us, just send them my way. We'll add them to the show notes. And again, I want to thank you for joining us. But before we end, Alex, do you want to give us a little bit more of that song? A little bit more of the song. It's not time to make a change. Just sit down. You hit it, Alex. You have to do the outro now in that high tone, okay? So take it away, Alex. Do the outro. Thank you to all our listeners. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Benzi, for joining us. Thank you to all of our <laughs> listeners for supporting the Jerry Pell Podcast. If you have a moment, please do uh, rate us on your favorite podcasting app. And thank you, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support. Benzi, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun. Goodbye, everybody.